Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Josh Goldstein. This is Michael Hun. Uh, today we're going to be talking about lessons from the field. Yay! Uh, yay! What what we've learned. Uh, I'll let Michael introduce himself a little bit. Personally, I've been working in search pretty much my whole career, um, starting with SharePoint, yay, and then um, moving along. And I was actually a customer of LucidWorks using Fusion before I graduated on to being an employee. And Leveraging and well, there goes the slide. So that was it, everyone. Uh, Don't touch the cord. I, I didn't touch the cord. Um, got it. Um, uh, I work in. I'm on the professional services team, uh, focusing on the full stack, leveraging Fusion and App Studio to help deliver applications to our customers. And hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Hun, and I've been working in search for quite some time since 2006. I used to do some uh, work with other search applications, which I won't name here because this is about Fusion. Fusion. <laughs> um, but uh, again, I've also been working at LucidWorks I was since 2016, so about three years now. And again, also a professional services consultant working with some of you I've worked with in this room on various uh, of your own search applications. And uh, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to start off with talking about the agenda. The agenda, and then we'll uh, dive right in. You can hit this button. Sorry. It works, too. Oh, wow. Technology. Um, buttons. So what we have a few things on the agenda that we're going to discuss today. And then we'll, if time permits, uh, we're going to uh, have a QA and a uh, session. But if we, if time does not permit, you're in, still in luck. We're both going to be going over to the booth and manning the booth so you can come over and ask us some follow-up questions if we don't get a chance. Or if we do get a chance, you can ask us more questions there. There was no coincidence around that one, no. so. Uh. <clears throat> um, I actually said I didn't want to do the booth. No, just kidding. Um, so, uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is we'll, it's what do the numbers tell us? This is more of an architectural design sort of question, and we'll get into some of that. Uh, then we're going to talk about getting to know your data now that your architecture is set up, what we need to do from an ingestion, a query, and an App Studio side to make sure that you're getting all the proper fields and metadata to serve up for that application. And then we'll follow up again with some, after that, we'll talk about the, the user experience within how that is translated within App Studio or the UI and it's through the back end with Fusion. And then we'll, follow, we'll, fo we'll finish off with countdown to launch, AKA let's go to production because why build something without going to production? And then like we said, it will we'll end that with the, with the Q and A uh, session. Okay, so what do the numbers tell you? Thank you. Uh, so when we, as a lot of, as all of us know when we're, when we first come into a situation where we're trying to design, uh, architect our, our hardware, um, in most cases, we're sold a, you're sold a certain amount of nodes. But the question still is, well, how many shards do I have? How, what's the replica, what sort of, how many replicas am I gonna have? What's the size of the shards? Uh, how, many, how many servers are, am I gonna put my shards on? Uh, the, the strategy I like to start off with is one server, one shard for solar. Indexing, uh, indexing content into that shard, and then being able to determine what your QPS and, and your documents per seconds are when ingestion or your QPS during queries time. Um, what, how, that, how the volume of documents and the size of the shard affects CPU and memory utilization, disk IO, and looking at network latency. So it's a way to sort of give you an idea of if I have, if I have 100 million documents, how many shards are, how, really how many shards am I going to, am I going to have, and how many shards are, am I going to end up putting on, on a particular set of servers. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is more about configuring a data source. So if you have a large volume data source like SharePoint or Google Drive or Box, something like that, um, one of the best practices that we, we we give is to split that particular data source into chunks. So you can, you can run these in parallel in order to, how, how, how much quicker it would be if you just have one data source configuration versus uh, for a Google Drive versus like five. 
if you can run all five of those in parallel with each other, your, your throughput's gonna be a lot quicker. So now that you know Michael has gone and graciously architected the back end, it's time to start determining what we need and what, what capacity do we need for the front end. Um, usually this is answered with how many concurrent users and the complexity of your app. Now when I say how many users, I'm talking about how many concurrent sessions, how many people are actively using the app at the same time. A standard four core 16 gig box could handle easily a couple of thousand users concurrently. So meaning those thousands of users could be, you could have a thousand people hitting the box at the same time. Another big key point is complexity. How complex is your app? How, what's, what's going on on that web page? How much custom customizations do you have? And another key metric for that is we count the number of queries. On an App Studio app, you could have as little as one query being fired off to Fusion, or you can have as many as like 10 queries, if, depending on the layer of complexity and the, the page style that you're, you're doing. So based on those two factors, you can easily determine one or two nodes three nodes of App Studio to serve up your app. And then you go into the things like high availability and disaster recovery. So taking whatever your, doc, your count is and just doubling it for your disaster recovery. OK, so now we'll talk about uh, getting to know your data. Um, this is sort of during your discovery stage. Um, I can, you can hear me, right? Uh, this, is this is more talking about the discovery stage during when you first initially start indexing. Um, if you don't, if, as you're looking at your, con thank you, as you're looking at your content, <clears throat> we want to be able to map certain fields to a particular sort of, uh, keeping in mind um, what we take in, just like when, when we eat, what we take in is that affects the performance of our body. Well, what we put into Fusion is going to affect the performance of what the, how that query is going to come out. So if, you wanted, if you're looking at to do things like stemming on a, on a query or, or at index time, or if you're looking for uh, synonyms, you want to be conscious of what field types that you're, that you're using. Um, <clears throat> I know like, like I've been in situations where um, a, a customer has configured a certain configuration to to point their titles and their body text towards a particular field type, but they couldn't understand why when they typed cancel, they weren't getting the result cancel with the canceling in the title. Well, you didn't turn, you didn't, you, you didn't use a, a field type with stemming. Essentially what I'm, what I want a sort of a takeaway from, from this entire conversation is Defaults are, defaults are set just to get you started. Even within, the, even within the cluster configuration, defaults with the JVM, defaults with, um, like I said, with the field types. But look at your data and go beyond just, just go beyond the field types because you might, find, you might find other situations or other types that you might want to utilize that are best fit for you. Okay. Yeah, this is still me, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so the net, So now that we've talked a little bit about the indexing, about indexing, like I said, what goes in is is going to affect how it comes out. Um, so again, so I'm querying on I'm querying on particular sets of fields here, um, like the title, the year, uh, the uh, what is this? Uh, the tagline. This is all. This is all movie data. So I want to be able to. I want to be able to to really. Um, if I'm searching for Star Wars, like that's the title of the movie. So if if it's in the title, then I want to. Then I'm gonna. I'm gonna boost that over. Maybe if it's in the body. Or but if it's in the key. Also, I have keywords here. That's an input. That's a, all fields are. All the fields are important. But there's certain weights that you might want to attribute to a particular set of fields because if that content is found there, it's obviously more relevant. Um, title is in an enterprise sort of situation is usually one of those fields that I that I would end up boosting on over the over the body. Oh, and one last thing. Sorry, I know I I know we'll go over, but um, when it comes to the return fields, uh, don't return the body. Because you're gonna, it's gonna affect. It's gonna. I think if you if you're indexing a, a, a two meg file and, you, and all of your content is like that, you'd be transferring that over the network. 
the body's not the body's good for is necessary for searching, but it, but if you're going to if you're going to include something like that, create a summary field out of it, which is a smaller which could be a smaller snippet of of your of your body in order for visualization. I, I can tell from personal experience um, when we took the body field out, there was a performance issue I was dealing with a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, we switched it over to a, a summary field and, well, we went from like seven second load times to like sub second load times and, you know, why, why have something uh, load in seven seconds? You'll never, your users just will go, will leave it. Um, building on Michael's talking about ingestion, um, one of the biggest key facts is facets, facets and filters. Facets are like the catch-all to make great applications. I love using them. They're a lot of fun, and the things you can do on the App Studio side, you can get real, you can get real creative with. Um, That's the only time you'll ever hear that facets are fun at yeah. this conference. Yes, yeah. facets are fun. <laughs> Key line of the day. Um, some of the things to know to get to prepare for faceting: um, how many facets per page? How does my data need to be set up? And then how do I actually choose what facet I want to use? So starting with the facets per page, uh, it really does depend on your use case. So when we say well, it depends. We really do mean it depends because each situation is actually unique. You do see some commonality, but, some, but at the end of the day, every, every application is different. Typically, we like to see, you know, for an enterprise search use case, maybe five facets. Anything more than that gets messy, and, you know, you'll have this long scrolling side, sidebar that people are like, oh, I don't want to do this. I just want to, you know, focus on my result set and really get there. Um, now, if you're talking from an e-commerce perspective, a very different story. I know on certain pages on Amazon, I have like 15 facets, but that's because, you know, I really want that Samsung 60-inch and the $400 price range that uh, is not refurbished. So, you know, having that right there, I just had four. Uh, then there's probably five-star reviews and so on and so forth. So really for an e-commerce, you can, you can get, you, can, you have a little bit more flexibility because of the way you're trying to look for a product. The next thing to do is how do I need to set up my data? So the data needs to be set up for strings, dates, and numbers, um, making sure that you, know, you have your string fields for your unstructured. So your, your, like, if you're people or the product name or something like that, make sure it's a string because that is an exact match in Solar, allowing you to actually filter down as opposed to with the text field, it'll tokenize it and you know, you'll have like a facet that says the dog went to the <laughs> park. Um, which you, do, you don't really want. Um, now, for situations like having a search within a facet, the best practice is to actually have a corresponding text field because you do want to actually go into that search. So if you're searching through people, you want that text field there to allow you to actually bring up Keith's name when, he, uh, when we try to search, search for him. Uh, and then finally wrapping up on the facets, what facet do I type do I choose? You know, for things like unstructured, you have a couple of options around single click, multi select, multi select, and insta multi select. Um, ranging from a single click, having that just, okay, I've clicked on this, now my search page is now going to actually filter. Um, going to the multi select around having the, um, having a logical or allowing you to say, okay, now in my movies, I want to see movies for comedy, romance, and crime having an apply button. There's also a feature in App Studio called the InstaClick, thanks to some other of my customers that I, I've loved, I've visited this year. Thanks, Ryan. Um, going through an InstaClick. So as I actually click on it, it's going to do that filter, but still allow me the options to continue searching for other, filtering on other facets. Finally, ro ro running down to the bottom, as you can see, uh, a range slider, having this range slider for the dates, um, the best practice around this is don't facet on a date field, use a range. Faceting on a date field, so if you have a million documents and you try to facet on a date, you're going to have a million individual <laughs> dates because the timestamps are down to the subsecond, and it would be really impressive to see if there's a two anywhere on there. <laughs> so by chunking it up, you're increasing, drastically increasing performance and allowing us, allowing the ability to do things like have a slider to see, okay, I know this movie was in the 2000s range, the first 10 years of 2000, so I can slide it in between, you know, 2000 and 2010. Okay. Moving on. The user experience. Um, this is a very, you know, a little more App Studio centric, a little more focused around 
how do you engage with your users, what goes on, and how do you actually keep those users from not using your app? You really only have a few, a few times to really get in there the first couple of times to wow the user, or they're just going to never use the application in your environment. So we're going to start, we're going to talk about the sign-on experience, the type-ahead experience, and the branding experience. So I have a question to the room. Who likes signing into things? Raise your hand. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, guys. That's what I thought. The best sign-on experience is no sign-on experience. Just if you can avoid it at all costs, avoid it like the plague. Because it really does detract the user from saying, oh, I got to find this password. I, no, never mind. I'm, I'm leaving. Most corporations nowadays have some sort of Kerberos or SAML or some other authentication strategies that do support the single sign-on. Leverage them. Just use them. It comes in. You type the URL, and then you're just there. You have your security all set up. I have all your information about you, too. So you know I'm going to big brother all of you. Um, there's also uh, some other edge cases, though, you'll see is, and we've done this in deployments in the past, is like, you know, if you have like a support portal or something, and you come in and you say, hey, um, I want to be anonymously log in, you know, it's a public website, but then I can sign in also and, you know, have my own personal, I have my saved support articles that I like uh, or, uh, or such other things. That's fine, too. Um, that's, that's really one of the only real cases where I can see that actually happening. Next is type ahead. Type ahead is a beast. You can do whatever you want with it because it's kind of great. You can, you could have something like a product search like Amazon does or with Google, you know, having the queries. Um, they're basically, you have a lot of different options for content such as titles, queries, maybe recommendations, maybe doing some more like this, more like this on, on your availability. Um, ooh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Titles and content. And really having the ability to choose whatever content that you want, you can basically just leverage in the type ahead. Now, that does bring up the question around value versus speed. Once you know, you choose what you want, there is a trade-off between, okay, using solar grouping is a little expensive. It's not too expensive, but it will actually, you will see a little bit of a difference. So having things like I just implemented a, uh, for a couple of people, the titles and the recent queries using grouping. Um, the speed was okay, but you know, at the end of the day, we've also found that in an enterprise search use case, titles eh, not not so useful because you know people unfortunately don't know how to name things. So you have that like parentheses untitled maybe 500 times just showing up in your search results, and it's like, well, this is useless. Um, but then again, going through and finding that you know, what other people are searching throughout the organization really does right. help them <clears throat> drive into that. I think a valuable data set that you'll probably want to start looking at leveraging are the signals in the signals collection, because basically that's where all the user search information goes to. So the, using, I mean, if you go on, uh, what's, that, what's that search engine on, online, uh, Google? Yeah, uh, like you that. start typing in you start typing in that search box. Those are those are previous queries that they that they aggregate from from other users. So, <clears throat> what your users have done in the past is is a good sort of first step in choosing in choosing these type type of heads. Like Josh said, title is is something that can be is something that can be used, but it it may not necessarily be that relevant that relevant piece of information. Yeah, actually, in in pretty much every implementation I've done this year, we started with titles and queries, and <laughs> by the time we finished our UAT, it was okay. By titles, it was, um, it was search terms and keywords. Yes, and building on that, you know, now that you have you've decided on your content, deciding what experience you want. So there's the, the options of either going through and actually kicking off a search or just going directly to that result page, you know, in an enterprise search or a Google-like experience, you know, you're going to want to actually, you see the query you have, oh, that's an interesting query, oh, it's, it knows what I'm asking for, and then go searching so you can get all the content back. But in a, like an e-commerce or a, or more of a like support use case, you could say, oh, I found the title of this, I found this document or this product, when I click in my type ahead, I'm just going to go directly to the details page and actually see that document. Um, Okay. Moving on to branding. Branding is fun. Don't do it alone. It's, uh, 
you know, I've found that it's a very collaborative effort between our team and the customer team and your teams, working with the UX designers, working <laughs> with other people, gathering the feedback from the field, leveraging mock-ups. Um, you know, always finding, I always like to find, uh, you know, we always try to look for if does a company have a branding guide with all the icons, not just half of them and missing Microsoft Word. Um, and then going through and working with the UX designers, it's a lot of fun working with a UX designer because then you can go back and forth and shuffle around and say, hey, can we do this? We're like, yeah, we can do that. Or no, we can't do that. And really just driving in and making sure that everyone's on the same page around that. Another thing is we have a lot of templates. Um, we have a lot of code that we reuse. I think 90% of when I'm like trying to do something, I know I go into GitHub and I do a quick search for that tag or whatever I'm trying to work for and I, I go and I, I find it in our GitHub. Um, yeah. The next thing is about also the paradigm of the dashboard result set details page. Uh, starting with the dashboard, coming in and seeing for our movies, you know, okay, trying to decide what movie do I want to watch. I've come into my dashboard and I see, you know, I have my visualizations around mysteries, drama, I can click on these things and start really drilling into what would I like, what am I in the mood for? Um, then going through and coming to, I'm in the mood to watch Star Wars. That is an awesome picture of Darth <laughs> Vader, by the way. Um, coming in, you now have the display in your, in your typical search page, seeing the images, seeing a little bit of information. You don't have to overload everyone on the results page. The result page is not there to show you and tell you about everything. It's really there to just inform you what are my options and how I can actually, and where to go from there. Going through that, I can then run through and get to the detail page where then I can see all the detail information. All right, I have an hour and a half to watch a movie, so clearly I can't watch Star Wars right now. Um, but you know, this is the type of thing that you would go in, see the details, as well as allow you to find out more information. The details page is really where you can have a lot of fun. You can go out and send out queries to other things, thinking like an enterprise search document. You get that 360 view of that document. So I could <coughs> then pull up widgets and put on the side of the page like, here, here's other related documents. Here's other documents by the author. Here's also when it was published. Oh, who do I need to go and actually ask? Um, rounding about getting you there. Finally, though, on these pages, Never give dead ends. So there always has to be a link. I know there's no link up here right now, but there is. Never have a dead end link. Don't just get them to the end and be like, OK, now what? Now where am I supposed to go? Have them ability to be like, oh, I can now navigate away. Maybe go back into a details page or another search results page looking at maybe the results of actors or directors <coughs> or genres that I'd like to see. Well. So uh, kind of backtracking to just a little bit of what, what Josh was saying about the user experience, um, this is some of the, these are some of the things that I would, I would consider like discussing right before you go to launch. Because one of the things that, that, we, uh, that we like to see our customers do before they go into their production environment is to actually put the system through. You've, you've, you've completed your indexing strategy, you've clean, completed your query strategy, you've gotten your UI, you've, you've gotten your UI together. Um, hopefully, in, during that process, as Josh has mentioned, um, I think in this group, we're all, a, we're all a diverse group of search professionals in some capacity, either we're, we, we're working the UI, we're working in the actual backend for the search, or we're a product. We're a product owner. We're a business. We're a business owner of the, within the product. So all of you should have been talking about this from from day one, to be honest. So in collaborating with each other. So that's really the start of the countdown to production is your conversation with each other. But once we but once we have but once we get to down to this final stage, we're going to start <clears throat> we're going to start looking at, at um, things like. Have you set your have you have you set your U limits? This is really important in uh, a, a high volume uh, enterprise search. You're in when you're indexing content. Like, 
you again with the defaults. If you if you spawn up a Linux server, the default for your open files is what 1024. That's not going to be enough if you're if you have a high volume index. So going through and making sure you're, you you've gone sort of beyond those beyond those defaults. Were you being honest? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I was trying to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah. So now that you know you've you've basically tidied up the back end, getting everything ready, checked your U limits, made sure that you know the servers aren't going to die. Um, you want to start, you know, going into the App Studio side. And what we do find is, you know, we're going to do a pretty extensive walkthrough. You know, we're going to hit the app a hundred times. I know Dave. Every time I try to push to production, I keep getting these little pings like hey, this tiny little widget right here, there's a little bit of a margin. I'm just like, oh, here we go. But, you know, it's, it's, it's all the good stuff because that really does, those kind of minor things really do make a difference in engaging your users and retaining your users for, for the application. Um, things that we do from an App Studio side are, you know, we check the environment. You know, are the servers running similar to Michael was saying? You know, are the U limits? Do we have enough memory? Is there enough horsepower? What happens if one of the nodes goes down and so on? Um, and then we go into the application. Are all my fields set up? Uh, let's make sure, you know, maybe we're using some aliasing around to make sure that if the field name does change, we can easily change it in the configuration file as opposed to having to go and redeploy your whole app because we all know how much fun pushing to production in certain things like banks is, uh, is a bit of a fun one. Um, then you want to go through, like, a lot of performance and really just, like, hammer it. Go as hard as you can at it and really just try and figure out what, you, what your threshold is. How many users can you get? How many users can you simulate at the time? How many queries can you simulate? H keep hitting different parts of the page. If you have one of those systems that can actually click on things and do that kind of stuff, even running through one of those. Overall, though, it's getting the plan together and making sure that you have a plan around this as well. Because we've gone in and sometimes not had a plan, and yeah. then it's like, oh, it goes in. But then a week later, we get called being like, oh, it's broken. Well, did we test it properly? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so that's basically what we like to do around getting ready for production. I would say another another one that uh, I think, and this goes for both front end and back end. Um, if do you have a do you have a repository that you can keep your configurations? Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's a there's a situation where maybe <clears throat> someone went in and changed. Uh, change some settings in your query or your indexing pipelines. <clears throat> but it was months ago, and <clears throat> you don't know, we don't know exactly what was changed or what wasn't. Um, so if we have it in our repo, we can at least bring it back and then re-implement it into, into, a new, into our new situation. It also, ha I mean, I, I, think that's one of, I think that's one of the things that um, we, we need to start, I, I at least, I'm beginning to start telling folks that this is one of those critical, these, that's one of those critical things because you can't call me a month later and say, Michael, do you have that index pipeline that we created? I'm gonna be like, no, because I'm on a different project and I probably, we didn't, didn't we put it in a repo? We have we, hundreds of yeah. pipelines on our laptops. Yeah. I, I don't even know where half of them are. Right? Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, Max search isn't the best, so you know. We really do, and then from the App Studio side, we really do like having it. We love, we lo we really do leverage GitHub a lot, and because it also helps us that if, like, for instance, if I'm running into an issue and I need Adrian to take a look at something, I he the first question he usually asks me is, is it in GitHub? And when I have to say no, it kind of starts adding complications, and we kind of get a little demotivated to trying to actually fix it. So keeping the code up to date in GitHub is always a really good thing. Um, because then I can actually get engineering eyes on it as well <clears throat> from an App Studio yeah. side. Um, yesterday I was having a conversation with someone about um, <clears throat> what's the most efficient way to get things into a uh, repo. Um, there's no direct click button and it goes to your favorite repository, but <clears throat> everything that you can do from the UI, well, I, I would say 90%, 99%, I'll say most things, um, you can do through a through a REST API call, so you can do it. You can call an export from a script and have that script push it to your Git repository. So it's sort of an automatic, maybe on a nightly basis or a weekly basis that you do that. And I guess another thing to add to that is, I know at some of our projects right now, we're actually going to be leveraging 
Git repositories and they put it actually into the build process. So they're like using Jenkins, it'll go into GitHub, yeah. it'll grab the repo, it'll compile the app, and then it'll deploy it into the web app service for me from an App Studio side. Um, that's always a lot of fun and it's, it makes it a lot easier. So then you don't have to really rely on your developers sometimes to push to production. You can just hit a button and say, voila, in 10 minutes, everything is going to be there. Now, 10 minutes, give or take, we'll see, but. <laughs> Okay. Anything else? I think, uh, no, I think we can go to the next slide. I think that this is going to be the fun one. Uh-oh. Question there time. Are no fun. <laughs> so, uh, so that's sort of the end of the presentation part of this conversation. Uh, and that's what this really is. It, I, wanted it, I think we wanted it to be mm -hmm. a conversation between us and you. Because these are things that, these questions we want to be able to think about and then take back out into the field as well. So. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to, to questions for anyone. Yes. <laughs> Are there any practices, uh, best practices that you're considering when deploying on premises when there's a multi-key environment that you encourage server size to be different when it comes to work? Yeah. Transport and configuration. Okay. So, oh, transporting the configurations yeah. from. I mean, yeah, yeah. Dev is going to be different from from QA, and QA may be different from your staging environment. Just in the sort of the build of it, and staging most likely is going to be a, an exact replica of what your production environment is. Um, when you're so back at the beginning, when I was talking about when I was talking about indexing, there's this stage called the Solar Dynamic uh, field. Dynamic field, field, mapper. field Mapper stage. It will take, it, it basically it takes, it, it will do an interpretation on that, on a piece of metadata and it will index it into a string or a text field or an integer field. Um, but it'll also, it just, uh, the, whole, the whole pipeline is just going to, you're going to end up indexing a lot of uh, metadata that you may or may not need. Um, then you'll get to a situation where you could have like a situation where you have 600 fields for a particular collection and the only thing that you really needed was the title and the body. You should have taken care of that in the mapping. So before, before, you, take, before you take your development configurations over to your, to your QA and, your, um, and to your staging, make sure you clean up, make sure that collection has been cleaned out so you're only really indexing the things that you, that you really need, that you really need. And also take that stage out of your index pipeline because you should be mapping, you should know exactly what you're putting into your system again. It, the, thing, the things that you don't need, like I can think of, a, I can think of something like in markup in, in, a, in a Word document. Do you need to know that uh, the background color was this for a particular document. You're not searching on that. You're searching on the content. So you want to make sure that you're putting clean sets of data into your into your higher level systems like your stagings and your productions. Yeah, and then from an App Studio side, there's a we have a concept of profiles. <laughs> I don't even know if that was actually my my phone or not. But <laughs> They're coming. It's real. They're Aliens scary. exist, everyone. Um, from an App Studio side, we have a concept of a feature of profiles. So we basically you can set um, in your build in your build cycle, uh, even if especially if it's automated. When you go into compile the app, you can actually say, okay, use my dev profile, use my test profile, and use my or my production profile. And really, it's a matter of just you can just set like one of the configuration files saying, okay, here's the here's pointing to my servers for. Dev, here's what the IP address is for my test, and then here's what my IP address is for my prod. I see you had a question. Actually, Go. I will respect your almost answer that my question about kind of property manager yeah. that uh, allow you to automatically promote from one environment to another. Yeah, in App Studio. That's, the, the, that's what we, the profiles would be used for, yeah. I saw someone we saw over here. Right. We're, <laughs> you go first, you and go then, first you go, and then we'll go, go to you. Yeah. I think that's good because um, we're still on this um, on the subject of um, yeah pushing the big button with just another parameter and um, deploying my system from that to UAT or test whatever and to prod. Um, and th this sounds very much uh, 
what, what you need for Fusion as well. So not just for App Studio, just just to change some parameters like um, the server connections, uh, for instance, or um, I don't know uh, starting links for for SharePoint, something like that. Um, is it all all also planned for Fusion for the the, the whole app, not well, just App Studio? So we do have the app export. Um, what we oh, have yeah, found yeah. is one of the, the one of the issues, and you know, it goes back to a security issue mostly, is around some passwords. So, for instance, at this oil and gas company we work with right now, they uh, they have this concept of a split password. So, not one person has the whole password, and you need to have two people come in. So, when you go into import, so we have all of our SharePoint configs, we have our SharePoint password, but when it comes time to moving environments, you're like. Oh boy, here we go. Because you then you have to go out and find that content owner, get them, get their schedules and stuff. So the app export does do pretty gets you ninety ninety five percent of the way there. It's more from the data source side that you will find that you're going to get a little bit of a headache because of passwords. Because you may have to authenticate yeah. getting it, so you'll need to supply those passwords as mm -hmm. well. Uh -huh. Well, just along the configuration management lines, um, what we've done is in the Git repo, we have different folders for staging, different by cluster. We have two clusters, and then also five versus staging, so that's four. You end up duplicating a fair number of things. Um, you don't just export the app and explode that and then commit it to the repository because that gives you an individual file for, say, solar config file. We also do individual exports of our main pipelines, whether it's index or query, because that's going to be easier to diff. Um, as the gentleman suggested, Josh suggested, you just wrap that in a script and you run it to scrape that out of a given instance. But very quickly, you can learn what your differences are, what's difference between the staging or between our US cluster, Europe cluster versus what's be different between staging and prod. And once you get those established, it's easy to write a script to say, OK, I'm going to do all my dev changes in US staging. And then from that, I need to move them to Europe. And then from there, I need to run something else to make those changes to those files for prod. Um, it, it, it sounds a bit convoluted, but again, as long as you get the pieces in place, it becomes repeatable. So okay. one sec. So we have time for one more in here, but other questions. We're Michael and I are going straight to the booth right after this. So, and I know I heard I think there's something like called lunch okay. around there too. So everyone's going to be heading up there anyways. Um, we'll end with sure. this gentleman's so question. Some more along these lines about this script to export <laughs> everything out that you talked about. Do you have an example of that in your knowledge base or on your public GitHub or something of how we export everything out and can start? Building stuff into our Jenkins or other things like that. The, the app export mostly does that. It's somewhat. It's improving. In, in this, well, I mean, there are like things that you mentioned, like substituting in values or in the newer versions, which I uh, don't is a core one, or maybe it's in the not release guide. Sorry, I lost track. I don't know whether it's in core one or it's going to be in core two. But like, so for example, the app export will do that, and um, the new import will support. You know, if you edit. Variables in there to load those variables in from a separate file. Different, you know, at the time. That's coming for you. Yes. Everything I want to get for <laughs> Four two is the magic number. Uh, okay. So I think we're pretty much out of time, but we're gonna. That that's him. <laughs> I think we'll get, we can get yeah, a, we we'll, can we're going to move up to the booth now. And, Thank uh, you everyone for coming. There was more people than I expected.